stay seated. I know you guys are getting on in years. It's all right. <laughs> Eric, do I, do I really have to say I'm sorry? <laughs> uh, my, Judy, uh, you're the first woman's pre... You, you remind me of my mom, by the way, I must say. But similar hairstyles and hair colors, and it's awfully elegant, I must say. But Eric has, you, I, I saw you talking with him before. Is it true that I have to apologize to the, all the umpires of the world? What do you, what do you people think? That's, that's what I thought, the hell with them. But, but there is one, I'm gonna, before I even start, because I'm gonna forget this otherwise, I'm gonna mention one umpire, there was thousands of them, thousands of them that I, that, uh, that attempted to call a match for me. And not one of them did a good job, it was unbelievable. <laughs> but there is one guy that did. And I don't believe, uh, Joe, correct me if I'm wrong, has an umpire ever been put in the Hall of Fame? Has an umpire ever made the Hall of Fame to this point? Because I, I don't believe that's ever happened. But I want to nominate the late, great Frank Hammond. Yeah. The late, great Frank Hammond, who was one, if the only, if not the only, pl the player's umpire. God rest his soul. If you're looking above, please, if the committee has any uh, sympathy for John Macrono, you know, because I'm pretty good about this umpiring thing. <laughs> he, he, should, he should be well considered. So um, God bless you, Frank, up there. <laughs> you know, he was part of that infamous match I played with Nastasi in 79 at the U.S. Open where, where he, he literally, if he had, could have gotten down from the chair, he was a bit overweight, admittedly, if he could have gotten off the chair, he would have gotten down on his knees and begged Nastasi to keep playing. He, he was begging him, he said, Ely, I don't want to do this. I don't want to default you, but I'm going to have to do it. If you don't play in the next half hour, hey, Ely. <laughs> but, but Ely couldn't do that, so, you know, I'm not really a, a forerunner. I mean, obviously, Mr. Nastasi knew a thing or two about questioning some calls, along with another guy by the name of Mr. Jimmy Connors. <laughs> but we'll get to those guys in a minute. It, it, it's, all, it's already been a, a great year for me, and I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to give you guys, because I think most of you people out there, and, and, and by the way, I want to say happy birthday to Mayor Dinkins over there. The great mayor of New York, David Dinkins, and apparently Virginia Wade as well. What a day. Virginia, stand up because... First, first Mayor Dinkins, because he really, uh, he loves the sport, and, and, and this is what this is all about. The fact is, is that the people that love the game of tennis, and the mayor is one of those people, he uh, managed to get those awful planes that were going overhead at the U.S. Open for so many years. Get rid of those so we can still hear ourselves think at this point in our lives. And, and Mayor, your forehand's pretty good. You got a little work you got to do on the backhand, in all honesty. But, but, but we love you anyway. So, so God bless. And Virginia, by the way, you, you've got to appreciate this day because never again will an English player win Wimbledon. So. <laughs> That's, that, that's quite an accomplishment, you know. And, and also, I must, I must give a, a, a thank you to Billie Jean King over here. Uh, but, yes. You know, because if it wasn't for her, we wouldn't have equal prize money now. And, and, and Billy, you know, when we first met, you probably don't remember this, but I was at Mary Carrillo's house back, way back when. I was probably 16, 17 years old. And, and Billy Jean was trying to sell me on this idea called Team Tennis. And, you know, I, I was a neophyte, admittedly, back then, but uh, I said, there's no chance in hell this is going to work. I mean, let's be honest. And Billy, I, I got to tell you something. There's no chance in hell this thing's going to work. <laughs> No, I'm kidding, actually. I'm kidding, because 
Only Billie Jean King would have the desire and dedication and the tenacity, and I must say I've tried to emulate that over the years as much as I possibly can, it's not easy, but she is one of the fierce, fiercest and greatest competitors the sport has ever had, and she's still, I'm gonna make myself, I know I'm old, okay, but I wanna just let you know that because of my horrible effort a couple years ago in team tennis, I wanna offer my services again for team tennis to get this thing going, all right? So, if that means, it, it means anything, because, Okay, uh, tomorrow, there's a match tomorrow, she said. All right, I, I've been practicing. If you notice, I was actually playing until the, pug, the, the plug was pulled on me, so. <laughs> you know, and I thought that would be just such a wonderful thing, you know. I'm fast forwarding a little bit, but uh, some of you may know that my first major title was in mixed doubles. And I thought, wouldn't it be a great way to end it if my last was in mixed doubles as well? what could have been. <laughs> Mary and I went over to the French Open. Is Mary Carrillo here, by the way? Well, she should have been here. <laughs> all right, you can call men's matches, all that other stuff, relax. You're one of the best. She should have been here, maybe, well, she's here in spirit because, because the mixed doubles uh, was something that I ran away from for 20 years after I had my initial good start. It is now 1999, 20 years has gone by. So in the year 2019, will someone please call me if they're interested in playing mixed doubles with me again? I think I've gotten over Wimbledon by then. <laughs> I, I have to say that I, I apologize to Ken McGregor. I, I congratulate him on being in the Hall of Fame, but I, I, I do apologize because, well actually, Ken, if you think about it, when you look over there at the McGregor and McEnroe clan, you, you're aware of the fact that Australia, what does that have, 18 million people? So America, which is about the same size as Australia, has about 250 million people. So it's only fitting that I have 15 out of the 16 seats. <laughs> so you guys have been dealing with that for centuries. We have, you know, we have, I, I don't know if this is true, I, I, you look like you sort of disagreed with me, but, you know, in the old days, the bad guys got tossed out of England and a couple hundred years ago, and they, and they tossed the bad guys to Ireland, I understand, they tossed the really bad guys down to Australia. So, so it, it's sort of fitting to me, in a way, that I, that, I, uh, that I am sharing this day with an Australian, because let's face it, the Australian tradition is absolutely fabulous in tennis, and uh, McGregor McEnroe, that's actually, you know, that's pretty close. So uh, congratulations on that, and I, and, I, and I appreciate you being here. I, yes. Yep. I'm going to give you a little history. I'm going to go back just for a second and give you a little history of how I got to this place, if you don't mind. I know that Fox Sports Net is, like, panicking already because I'm... Uh, are we all right up there, Barry and Leith? Do I got two minutes more? Or? It's not easy to get it in, in in four or five minutes, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, plenty of time. How much time do I got, actually? Shh, close it down, McEnroe, quick, you know. I feel like there's something in my ear. But I'm gonna just give you a little history of how I got to the place, because I think, well, excuse me, at least a lot of you tennis fans um, are aware of perhaps some of the accomplishments that Eric mentioned, the Wimbledon and, and U.S. Opens and, and the other events, but they're not sort of aware of the people that were critical to me getting to that place. So uh, a, a quick little history, if you don't mind, because it started for me about, what, eight and a half years old. Uh, my parents joined a club about a block away. There was only uh, tennis and swimming at, at the club, so I, f uh, I said, well, tennis sounds, sounds a lot better than swimming. So let, let's try this one. My parents over there, God bless them. Thank you. I'll never say this again, but thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. I, you know, I, I sort of butchered that line over the years and admittedly overused it. And, and I promise you this will be the last time I ever say it, but, but thank you, because, because what it did was it, it, it gave me so, so, something to do to keep sort of, I'm a little 
got a fair amount of energy, so I needed to keep, I got to burn the calories, if you know what I'm saying. So, are you doing okay over there, Mom? Yeah. <laughs> she, she never had a whole lot to say. The, I, I, you got to, I got to say, Mom, I love you, um, because you didn't seem to care one bit whether or not I, I won or I lost, or if I played for that matter. <laughs> you kept telling me to get a damn education and do your homework and all that type of nonsense, which I'm trying unsuccessfully to tell my kids, by the way. And the only time that you actually did come to a match was when you expected me to lose. And, you know, of course, when you need your mom is when you lost, so... She was, it, 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 the, the good part was that I knew she was there, in case I thought. The bad part was that I thought I was going to lose all of a sudden. <laughs> but, you know, you have to take the good with the bad. And, and, and believe me, there's, there's a hell of a lot more good. And, and, and uh, there, there really isn't any bad, actually. It's, it's, it's beautiful, thank you. I, I uh, was fortunate enough at that particular time, uh, a, a guy by the name, and I'm going to give credit to the first person, Dan Dwyer, who was recently nominated into the Eastern Tennis Association Hall of Fame, I think last year or the year before. He's probably not here either, huh? <laughs> he was the first guy that taught me, and, and, and I guess this is the reason why, now that I think about it. He was the first guy that ever gave me group lessons. He told my parents I had no future, is that right? <laughs> no chance to make it. And now he's the head of the Eastern Tennis Association, Judy, so... I don't know what to make of that. <laughs> um, af after that, it was a guy by the name of George Seawagon, who uh, became the pro at this local club, the Douglaston, Douglaston Club, who I have represented, by the way. I must say, I'm happy to see a couple of true representatives of the Douglaston Club standing over there. And, and I'd, I'd, I'd like you to give a quick round of applause to Jim Malamy, Doug Saputo, and Andy Broderick, three of my oldest friends in the world. <laughs> And they, they, they know what it was about down, uh, over at the Douglaston Club. Um, it was a, uh, George Seawagon was the first person who told my parents, hey, hey this guy's not bad. Maybe, uh, maybe you got something here. Um, so he suggested to my parents that they put me in a couple tournaments. Uh, he also suggested that I go play at this place uh, called the Port Washington Tennis Academy, which none, none of us had heard about, obviously. And supposedly it was this place where some clown from Australia named Harry Hopman was, you know. Well, little, little did we know how much of an impact Harry Hopman would have on, on, on my career. Um, one of the earliest tournaments I ever played was, was at Forest Hill Stadium playing uh, against a guy by the name of Larry Lynette, who was uh, the best player, in, in, or, or one of the better players in the East at the time. I watched him play before the match. I said, Jesus, this... I gotta be honest, this guy doesn't look like he's all that great. Uh, I, I, I think I can handle this guy. And, and so I called my parents up, I said, don't worry about it, all right, everything's cool. I'm gonna beat this guy, just pick me up in about an hour and a half. <laughs> that was including the shower and the stretching that I didn't do then. And he said, uh, and, and after I lost 6160 in about 45 minutes, <laughs> I had to reassess the situation just a touch. Um, the, uh, but, but fortunately enough for me, at that time, I was sent over to this Port Washington Tennis Academy, where lo and behold, I ran into two gentlemen who really changed... Uh, uh, Ava, we okay over there? It changed my career, and, and I feel greatly contributed to the player I am today, one of which is Harry Hopman, who is in the Hall of Fame. You may have heard of him, the great Australian Davis Cup captain. I think Ken mentioned him in his speeches. He was a, a, a fantastic old man um, uh, who had, fortunately for myself, actually had a falling out with the Australian Federation and had moved to Port Washington, Long Island. Now, why, I don't know, but thank, thank you. Thankfully, he did. And he used to tell my parents and myself stories about the Davis Cup and how much it, it meant to him and the opportunities he had to work with the McGregors and the Sedgmans, the Lavers, the Rosewalls, among others, uh, the, some of the all-time greats. And 
He also attempted to get me to work out a little bit harder than I wanted to. But fortunately, he had mellowed in his old age. He was a real tough taskmaster, but he, he, he mellowed. He saw Mackinac and he said, you know, I think uh, it, it is why I feel so special today in a lot of ways, because I feel like I've been blessed uh, by people who saw something in me um, and sort of, I don't want to say let me off the hook occasionally, because uh, of course then people are going to assume that um, that they let me off the hook when I question calls. And funnily enough, I looked at the, uh, the USA Today the other day, and, and Doug Smith had written something nice about me, and, and I appreciate that, something nice in the newspaper. I noticed a quote from my old man over there, my John, John Patrick Macrono Sr. And he also said, he said something about, um, you know, I, 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 I constantly told John to, to, to cool things out. Um, you know, I, I really tried to, to get him to realize that it wasn't necessary to yell at the umpires. And, and let, let me just, I, I'm just going to take this out. Just, spare, you know, am I in trouble yet time-wise? Let me know when I've got three minutes. Because I feel like I have such an opportunity here that I don't have with, you know, these, when, when I do the commentary work, you know. Let's go to commercial. Uh, we're lucky if we make it back for the first couple points in the next game. So, But I see here, I don't know if this is true, Dad, but it says here, I must have said something to him 5,000 times. John, y y you can't do that. It's outrageous. It doesn't help you. It doesn't help your game. There, you'd be a better player if that was true. Now, now I want to just ask you, Dad, uh, I love you greatly. Number one, I want to ask you, because, you know, this is newspapers after all, so I've got to ask if that quote is accurate, number one, Bef before I even comment on that, because, you know, it's probably not true, right? It is true, okay. Now, I'm going to give you, just to show you where, because, you know, an apple never falls far from the tree. You've heard that saying, right? I'm going to show you exactly how he said that to me, okay? the 5,000 times he told me to get an idea of where I was coming from, okay? I'm gonna step back a little bit. You ready? You can't do that! <laughs> I've told you 5,000 times not to do that! So, so you see, uh, <laughs> there's a little bit of my parents in me, whether they like to admit it or not, but I do take full responsibility. I take full responsibility for my actions. Um, the other person who I uh, wanted to mention, who was the, the instrumental force in, in, in my career, I, I believe, taught me how to play this game, um, and taught me how to play it in a way that I actually really appreciated, to try to play the game and in, in a different way to, to, to be aggressive, to take the ball on the rise, to take chances, and to try to play a game where you would use the, almost a mathematical, uh, math, analyze the, the, the match mathematically, where you would, um, I'm sorry to see my, one of my daughters crying. I don't know what I said there, but <laughs> it's, we're falling to pieces here as we speak. But, First of all, I want you, Tony Palafox, I want you to please stand up right across the court here. There he is, Tony Palafox. And, and, and also his wife, Leslie, is sitting right next to him. Leslie Palafox, yeah. And she's English, and she understands what I was saying about Virginia, so it's not going to happen for a while. But Tony actually just told me that he won the Newport doubles here in 1959. He won the Wimbledon doubles in 19, was it 63? 62, 63, I believe. He was part of a Davis Cup uh, team with Mexico, the late great Rafael Osuna, who's in the Hall of Fame in 19, uh, was that 63 as well or 66? 63, yeah. But more importantly, so, so his credentials spoke for themselves, but more importantly, no matter how many times I freaked out while we were working together, Tony, 
Never once did he raise his voice. Never once did he look at me and said, this guy is absolutely insane. You know, how, how could he possibly care as much as he cares or, or, or get this upset? And he sort of sat back and he even got to the stage uh, a little bit later in my career when I was about 19, where he said, he noticed that I'd altered my serve where suddenly, where I used to serve straight head on, suddenly I was standing sideways at the court. And so what Tony did was, he didn't tell me not to do that. He, he actually, uh, he went back to his, uh, his house. He started to serve sideways himself to try to figure out, maybe there's something to this. Now that to me is a, is this, you know, I fell into it by the way. It was complete luck that I did that. My back was bothering me. I started leaning over and sort of, uh, hey, this relieves a little bit of tension, so this is cool. So it was complete luck that I sort of fell into that stance. But Tony adapted, and that to me is a sign of a great coach. And Judy, by the way, because I'm hopeful that someday we can do something together, if you know what I'm saying. Um, number one being that at the Flushing Meadows, which we have a great opportunity, I must say, to do something fantastic. It's the type of people like Tony Palafox who will be a great benefit to our young kids of America to teach them how to play this game. So one more round of applause for you, Tony. Thank you. I, I, I also, I, I want to thank next up, I want to give a thank you to someone who's not here, but my brother, my brother's over there. I don't, I don't know where he is. I try to get in touch with him, but Carlos Gaffey, wherever you are, just remember the phrase, just toughen it out. Just toughen it out no matter what happened. That's what he said to me. How do I play this guy? Just toughen him out. This guy's got a huge serve and volley game. Just toughen him out. That's it, but, but, but it works. So Carlos, wherever you are, thank you. I noticed someone in the corner who I've got to give a, a, a minute to as well. And that's an old friend of mine, an old supporter of mine, Mr. Gene Scott, over there in the corner. Gene, stand up for a second. Gene Scott. Because Gene Scott was, was, was like, uh, well, I hope this is an insult, but sort of like an, an uncle, in, in a sense, to me. Because he, he, had, he had taken um, Vetus Gerolitis, who, who, by the way, uh, God rest Vetus Gerolitis' soul. He was someone who I looked up to greatly as a kid, and I hope someday will join me in the Hall of Fame. One of the great characters that tennis has ever had, Vetus Gerolitis. And I noticed that Gene, in, in his younger days, would, would sort of take some of the up-and-comers in, in, um, in New York under his wing. You know, Gene would go out of his way to, to practice with me. The following is a special presentation of Fox Sports Net. There are many things that can be said about John McEnroe. I love watching John play over the years. He was very instrumental in helping me win my, my first slam. You know, the one guy that probably had more talent than, than anyone ever playing this game. I had a lot of respect for what he had to say. John McEnroe is a dominant personality. He was an artist. He's controversial, outspoken, brilliant shot maker, volatile, brash, a celebrity, a champion. He's intense, emotional, temperamental. He's John McEnroe, and today he joins the International Tennis Hall of Fame. We're in Newport, Rhode Island. We are in Newport, Rhode Island at the International Tennis Hall of Fame, and center court, John McEnroe is live talking about his great circuit. career. Let's go to center court and John McEnroe. Uh, Gene, you're, you know, you're best known for being the best friend of uh, Richard Raskin, and I don't want you to go down in infamy with that. Y you all know who Richard Raskin is, right? Yes. R later, Renee Richards. 
Whoa. Uh. Real quiet all of a sudden. <laughs> and I didn't see Gene much after that, so. But, <laughs> I want to personally thank you for, for, for helping me a, a, as a youngster because, because if it wasn't for people like you, I wouldn't be in this position right now. There's a couple, couple other people I want to thank, uh, uh, one of which is, uh, and I wish he was here, Dr. Irving Glick, who was a great, great fan of the game of tennis, is the doctor at the U.S. Open. Uh, yeah, give him a round of applause. God knows he deserves it. Well, this speech that you're listening to live was supposed to be wrapped up about Dr. 20 minutes Omar ago. Fareed, but God knowing John McEnroe, soul, as we all do, he is still Davis holding Cup forth. Doctor. And so we're a rare opportunity I here think they to go live to center court and hear from the man the who is being Dr. inducted Irving right Blake now into Dr. the International Omar Tennis Fareed. Hall of Fame. We're on Fox Sports Net. And, David Mark, and this and is John McEnroe, your name a live well. induction speech as we speak. David used to run things at Kalamazoo, which was our national 18 and unders. Is that planned? Did you plan that? <laughs> and David was um, very nice to me. I've got to bring this story up because it's a very memorable story to me, at least. But I was in the first round of the 16 and under Nationals. First, first, second game of the match, and they had these light posts in the back of the court, and I thought, and they've got to be 15 feet from the baseline, so there's no problem there. And I was playing a guy that, by the name of Rocky Royer, and he hit an overhead that was way over my head, but I was determined to give it my best shot. And I'm running back, I look back, I see this light post, I say, no, I, I'm not gonna hit that. I'm gonna hit the ball first, and right as I was about to hit the ball, smack, head first into the light post, the old fall over, pass out, unconscious. Friends of mine uh, jumped on the court, it's part of the Junior Davis Cup team. Uh, who, who uh, hopefully, I'm not going to mention each and every one of you guys, but uh, it was a great experience to be uh, the junior, part of the Junior Davis Cup team. And Bill McGowan, who was the coach, I want you to, I haven't forgotten you. You know, you had an intensity to you that I appreciated. But at any rate, um, I wobbled off the court. It had to be, what, 30, 40 minutes later. David says, you, are you ready to play now? And now, I don't think in these day and age, uh, David, we were just actually talking about it yesterday, that David said they, that the rules don't, is that another rule that I caused to change? I'm single-handedly responsible for about 15 rule changes in tennis, which, which is probably the only, am I time up? To, uh, two minutes. <laughs> just when I was getting going. What, 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 we got, who, who's playing? Are they getting all hyped up there, the semifinal? Can they wait a little bit or? <laughs> One minute. Um, well, for all of you that um, I don't mention, I apologize, because I will mention them later. But, David, I have to say, you know, when we used to go over the JDC to your house, I'm going over a minute, by the way, so the hell with you guys. Um, <laughs> It was the barbecues that really got me the most, I must say. When we had to listen to you talk about the state of tennis, that will be something I never forget and I hope never happens again. <laughs> I've got to be honest. But my favorite part was when you're up on that big top of that platform. Hey, guys, quit cheating down there. If I, if I don't see you, if you keep cheating, I'm going to have to default you. So I, but I won't mention names. I won't mention names. I'm going to fast forward now because there's a couple people that I'm not going to that I probably will forget. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to briefly mention my, 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 uh, my favorite and best buddy that I had on the tennis circuit and the favorite doubles player I ever played with, Mr. Peter Fleming. There he is over there. The perfect partner for me and the perfect friend to have. Um, we'll speak more about that later because apparently I'm a little pressed for time and apparently it was Fleming of all people because he's coaching this guy Lawrence Thielman who's apparently in the semis. Oh, Lawrence Thielman fans, great. And, and, and all of a sudden he, he, uh, 
he wants to play now. So uh, Peter has sent word that I must cut my speech. But I still, uh, I still appreciate your friendship, Peter. Um, I see looking straight across, I've got to mention another guy who I think is uh, quite possibly should be destined for the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to finish up in just two, three minutes, Bob, okay? <laughs> Jesus, these network people are unbelievable. When I went to college, there was a guy by the name of Dick Gould, who I must say thanks to, Coach Dick Gould of Stanford University. And, yeah, absolutely. Don't cut this part either. My 30-minute speech is going to be a 20-second snippet on Fox Sports West later. <laughs> Dick Gould, I believe, should be in the Hall of Fame because you know why? He's won approximately, I think, 15 or 16 in the last 22 years. Stanford has, has won the national title, and na national title 16 times the last 22 years. It's probably more than that. And we need to encourage people to stay in college a little bit, don't you think? Yeah. It was the best thing that I ever did. My buddy over there, Bill Mays, I've got to say, my doubles partner at Stanford University. Bill, stand up for a second. I've got to mention my great, uh, Bill, thank you for, you know, blowing that match in the NCAA final, semifinals, but that's okay. I can say that now because supposedly I'm this great doubles player, so anytime it, I lost tech place, it was, uh, it was their fault now. So, like, like uh, where's my brother Mark? Did he just split or something? There, Mark, stand up there because he's the only guy I've never won a doubles match with. Yeah, that's, that says something. But Mark, I've got to say I love you because this is one of the very few instances where I can honestly say there was not a jealous bone in this, my younger brother's body. He's three years younger than I am. I, I sense a tremendous am amount of support throughout my career. And, and, I, and I want you to know how much I appreciate that. Diane, his wife right here with their beautiful new baby, Kieran. And Mary Jane, Diane's mom in the back, it's great to see you here as well. I, I, I think you're in the back back. There she is, Mary Jane, nice to see you. And he was someone who was always there for me, so I appreciate it. And, I, and I, I've got to say, I apologize because I couldn't win a match, you know, on the senior star. We were all in three, but I mean, I'm not giving up yet, okay? I got tossed by Steffi. You know, you got you to gotta keep trying. You know, you never say, you never. Say never. My brother, Patrick McEnroe, here. Yeah. My brother, Patrick McEnroe, was a great player. Well, that's debatable. Um, and, and, and he's also a great commentator, so I'm proud to have him as part of... Yes, he absolutely, absolutely. This guy won the, uh, the French Open doubles. He's gotten to the, uh, as a matter of fact, my favorite line that he ever said was when he got to the semifinals down in Australia back in 91, I believe is the right, that, that year. And he was in the semi semifinals along with the guys by the name of Ivan Lendl, Stefan Edberg, and Boris Becker, and Patrick McEnroe. So, yes, well, absolutely. <laughs> He, he, uh, he was asked, how does it feel to be in the semifinals uh, of this Grand Slam event? And he said, what are you, surprised? I mean, wh what do you expect? You got Lendl, Edberg, Becker, and McEnroe, you know. And, and, and Patrick, I love, I love what you had to say about me last night. It was a beautiful speech, and I, and I always appreciate it. Uh, the last couple of people, the late, great Arthur Ashe up there, God, God bless your soul. Tony Trabert, I want to say a special thank you to you. Tony was my first Davis Cup captain, and he, he, was, he, was, uh, he was my best Davis Cup captain. He, he, he knew how to press my buttons in a positive way. And I pressed his buttons in a positive way until about our third year when I press his buttons in an unpositive way. And, and I, want to, I want to apologize to you, Tony. <laughs> 
and, and I will apologize to the umpires now because I'm in a very op apologetic mood. Um, I, wanna, I, I, I wanna make sure that I don't forget anyone re here. I'm right at the end, but I've gotta, I've gotta bring up my great rivals, uh, Bjorn Borg, number one. That damn Jimmy Connors. <laughs> David Markin, who was one of my uh, David, uh, was the head of the Davis Cup Committee. I mentioned Gordon Jorgensen. I uh, have not mentioned. I want to thank him um, for being behind me. Joe Carrico, the late Joe Carrico, who was, uh, had the guts to pick me, uh, and Tony as well, the guts to pick me to go down in Santiago, Chile, my first Davis Cup match in 1978. Um, I'm going to look real quickly, so I hopefully I haven't forgotten anyone. Um, I, I want to say how much it means to me uh, to, be, to be here today. I was, had an opportunity. I bombed out in Newport in 77. And it, 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 hung, it made me hungry because I got off the semifinals of Wimbledon in 77 where I had this tremendous run. It changed my life entirely, the uh, 77 experience. I came back to Newport and they tossed me out to one of those outside courts and I lose to not VJ Army Trust, but VJ's brother Anand. So I always wanted an opportunity to come back, and I did get that opportunity one other time in 1991 playing Davis Cup here against Spain. And it is a beautiful place. It is a beautiful place. It is a great place to have the Hall of Fame. I couldn't be happier to be here today. I want to thank you all. And there's one last person. Oh, you, you want me to do a couple more? Or do... <laughs> Ruby, my stepdaughter, you look absolutely beautiful. You are wonderful. And, and I want you to know that you are a very important part of my family, OK? I want you to know that along with, that's, that's Ruby Smythe Myers, the beautiful Ruby Smythe Myers. Needless to say, the love of my life, Patty Smythe, They've already been mentioned. Kevin, you're looking handsome as ever, but could you sit up a little taller, please? <laughs> Emily, the beautiful Emily there, the eight-year-old. Sean over there, my 11-year-old son. Anna's crying somewhere in the back. But I'm gonna mention one other person because I think tennis is really, it's really about not just how much you accomplished perhaps at Wimbledon or the U.S. Open or the Davis Cup, but it's for people that love the game of tennis. So as my final word, I'm going to suggest that as a final Hall of Fame person, we put, put her in before she passes away, Miss Dodo Cheney. Dodo Cheney, okay? She never won a Wimbledon or she never won a you know, U.S. Open. She was maybe a quarter finalist or one of... But thank, hey Bud, thank you. Bud, and I, Bud just told me she won the Australian Open, which is, which is uh, quite an accomplishment, even though it was the junior mixed doubles. But that is, and, and Bud, thank you for loving the game of tennis. And, I've got to take your temperature. I mean, Dodo Cheney, by the way, has won 301 national titles. So let's think about that, but, but, uh, you know, I, I, I've got to take your temperature, my dad. What the hell is wrong with your outfits today? You almost look normal, you two. <laughs> God bless everyone. Thank you very much.